My name is Dick Cole. I was born in September 7, 1950. The first time I flew in an airplane was in 1926. The occasion was uh, at the county fair, a guy had a Ford tri-motor that uh, he was giving people's ride for a dollar. It was a single wing, uh, three engines. Uh, it looked like it was made out of uh, corrugated roofing. <laughs> well, it was a kick in the butt. <laughs> These men are aviation cadets. A short while ago, they too were average American boys from average American families. In the near future, they will have learned many things. How to pilot a plane, how to navigate, or how to operate a bomb site. I entered the uh, U.S. Army Air Corps on the 22nd of November, 1940. At that time, the Army Air Corps uh, was the only uh, uh, flying uh, part of the Army. The first time I saw a B-25 was at Feltz Field, Spokane, Washington. The Mitchell B-25 was the first airplane made by North American Aircraft Company that was bought off the shelf. Instead of it going through an extensive test program, it came off the line. We, we flew to the plant and picked them up. Uh, it was like going in and buying a car. After we got in the airplane to fly it, uh, uh, I liked the way it flew and I liked the way it uh, had uh, some uh, engines that uh, would uh, take you through the air at about 260 miles an hour. So there's your Mitchell. Intelligent, disciplined pilot technique will make these babies do everything but talk. Speed, endurance, responsiveness, everything it takes for long, hard missions. And plenty of protective armament besides. Yep, there she goes. Treat her right, gentlemen. And you'll see why the experts call her the best medium bomber in the world. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. The attack also was made on all naval and military activities. On the, the 7th of December, uh, we had landed in California, March Field, on Friday and uh, we were given permission to leave March Field. So we all went to Hollywood, and uh, we were in the Hollywood Plaza Hotel. I was a co-pilot at that time. I better find out where my pilot is, uh, because uh, we'll be going back to Pendleton, Oregon, where we were based. Uh, we changed uh, things in the bomb bay, and, uh, uh, put on bombs and went on sub patrol duty out of Seattle and Everett, Washington. We did sub patrol about uh, maybe a little over a month. After Pendleton, uh, uh, we were transferred to Columbia, South Carolina. Supposedly, our assignment there was to do some training and then go to Africa. They were called for volunteers, and uh, we volunteered. Uh, we volunteered for a supposedly a dangerous mission, and that's all we knew about it. On the day that uh, Colonel Doolittle came to stay and be part of the group uh, training, the pilot that I was going with uh, got appendicitis. I went to the ops officer, uh, and he uh, looked over his uh, assignment papers and said, well, the old man is coming in this afternoon, and uh, I'll crew you up with him. If you do okay, you got yourself a pilot. As a kid there in Dayton, uh, I used to sit on the river levee and watch uh, Doolittle, McCready, and the old timers at uh, McCook Field. And I could uh, ride my bicycle over and sit on the levee and watch what was going on. 
So I knew who he was, and uh, I had a scrapbook of he and uh, some of the other old timers. He was very well educated. He explained that if you have an idea or a question, tell me about it or ask me. Everybody uh, was able to to voice their opinion with uh, no problems or anything. He handled it very well. Colonel Doolittle, uh, in making his plan, uh, which uh, airplane, he had to take an airplane out of the inventory. He thought of the B-26, the Martin B-26. It was a little bit too uh, unstable for uh, young pilots. B-18, which was a bomber, a Douglas bomber, it was too big to fit on the carrier. To test a short field takeoff, uh, they put two B-25s on board the Hornet. They successfully made the takeoffs that uh, precipitated the, the mission. The way the Navy accepted uh, our being on a, a carrier was a little bit stiff to begin with. Uh, we didn't blame them because, uh, number one, uh, our airplanes took up the deck and uh, their airplanes were in down in the second deck. The other thing is that uh, uh, the sleeping quarters uh, uh, were not available and uh, we had uh, 24 crews on the carrier at that time. So that meant we had 24 bunks in the companionways and uh, we caused them to alter their, their um, uh, normal operations uh, to take care of us. Uh, after uh, two days at sea, uh, we were told that uh, this fourth is bound for Tokyo. The attitude changed. Uh, they couldn't do enough for us. So we were on the same team then. Uh, the first thing that was uh, uh, came to my mind when I announced where we were going was to, to beat Colonel Doolittle to the airplane. First off, uh, we had to pull the props through because of the oil uh, draining out. The other thing was uh, uh, the crew had talked about uh, uh, the pressure that Colonel Doolittle was under. We wanted to make sure that we would do everything that we could do to make things easier for him when he got to the airplane. Uh, we were supposed to launch at dusk on the 19th. Actually, we left at 8.20, uh, which put us over Japan at uh, high noon. Well, we had taken off of a dry runway with the same load and a 10 knot wind. We knew that we could get off with the wind and the ship wind. The first time we've taken off of a carrier was uh, when we launched for the mission. You, you wonder what you were heading into and uh, uh, wondering uh, what was going to happen next. You began to think about uh, what, what's going to happen to you personally uh, uh, because none of us had been in combat before. Uh, not even Colonel Doolittle. You just had to make up your mind that you don't worry about things happening to you because it's a waste of time. We were, we flew the the mission uh, at uh, I'd say an average of 250 feet or 300 feet, except uh, the, the bombing mission. The planes sweep in without being discovered. They separate into groups to attack the several objectives carefully selected by means of accurate intelligence to ensure that only targets of military value will be hit. Colonel Doolittle himself has told of flying over the Emperor's palace and refraining from bombing it, though he could have left it in ruins. En route to China after we bombed Japan, uh, midway through the uh, flight toward China, uh, Hank Potter passed a note up to uh, Colonel Doolittle and, and uh, by his figures we were going to 
have to or we're going to run out of fuel about 180 miles short of the Chinese coast. At that time, uh, we went through our ditching procedure and uh, just kept flying. The big storm had developed over China. It developed a what they called a, a kamikaze wind, which blows from west or east to west. And that gave us a tailwind. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, all the airplanes but one made it to China. Uh, but on the other side of the coin, uh, when we got to China, the weather was so bad there was no place for us to land. And uh, as a result, we had just had to uh, fly a magnetic heading that uh, we were on uh, and uh, we climbed up to 9,000 feet and uh, uh, when the uh, gas indicators indicated that uh, uh, we were going to run out of fuel, uh, uh, Colonel Duda gave the order to bail out and uh, uh, Paul entered, uh, the crew chief went out first, and then the bombardier, and then the navigator, and then myself, and then Colonel Doolittle. The big worry about jumping out of an aircraft in fog is that uh, uh, you become a bit apprehensive of how you're gonna, what you're gonna hit uh, when you hit the ground. Uh, in my case, uh, I was very fortunate. My chute uh, drifted over a pine tree and uh, left me hanging about 12 feet off the ground, which I didn't realize until the next morning. The morning after our, our bailout, uh, everybody had a, a compass, and uh, the name of the game was to start walking west toward uh, uh, least occupied territory. After walking uh, all day, uh, uh, I came out on a cliff of the, a building down below had a Chinese nationalist flag on top. So I walked down there and uh, uh, was accosted by a Chinese soldier. He took me to a, a building that had nothing in it but a table and a chair. But on the table was a piece of paper with a sketch of a two-tailed airplane. And I finally got him to take me where he took the guy that drew the drawing. I walked in this building when there was a pretty dingy, uh, and, and of course it was at, at night, but uh, I saw a gentleman standing off to the side, and uh, it was Colonel Doolittle. I said, boy, am I glad to see you. <laughs> and he said, I'm glad to see you, and uh, I said, I'm happy you're not injured. About an hour after that, and they had picked up Paul Leonard and Fred Bramer and Hank Potter. So we were all together that night. We were satisfied that, number one, we had done the first part of the original plan, which was to let the Japanese know that they were not uh, safe from air. Uh, we didn't know about it, but it improved the morale of the Allies and the people back home. I don't think any of the, the group consider themselves to be heroes. We were job-oriented and uh, we were all happy with the fact that uh, uh, we did our job. The heroes of World War II were not only the people that uh, gave their life, but uh, uh, the people like the men and women that uh, uh, built the equipment that uh, we were able to fight the war with. When people interview you, what's your favorite question to answer? 
Uh, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> You've had enough. <laughs>